Hello everyone and welcome to this BRE Global presentation which I'm giving today. This presentation today is about a report which we've recently published entitled US National Fire Alarm Code NFPA 72 and European Standards in the EN54 Series Assessment of Compatibility. There is an increasing tendency around the world for specifiers to require that fire detection and alarm systems must comply with the requirements of NFPA 72. There is a natural assumption that all equipment used within such installations must comply with the ANSI UL or FM series of standards. BRE Global has challenged this view. We believe that products which comply with EN54 are suitable for use in an NFPA 72 system. To this extent, C.S. Todd and Associates were commissioned to provide an assessment of compatibility between the product-specific requirements of NFPA 72 and those in EN54. The report that has been generated contains the finding of the assessment of the compatibility of the European EN54 standards with the requirements of the 2007 edition of the US National Fire Alarm Code, NFPA 72. A revised version of the code has actually been published at the beginning of January 2010, but the changes made within it, we do not consider them to be applicable to this study. Here is a list of standards which we've included within this study. I want to talk about the way in which the assessment has been made by the consultants that prepared the report. For each product type in EN54, a search was made within the NFPA 72 code for references to that particular equipment or device, and a list was made of all of the appropriate extracts. Where these extracts relate to the manner in which the device or equipment forms part of a fire alarm system, such extracts have been excluded from further consideration. The assessment process has focused on comparing the technical requirements for the equipment as set out in both documents, and not how the product is installed within a building. These are code of practice requirements which were not considered further. I want to talk now about the findings which have come out of this report. For each of the ten product types that have been assessed, the relevant NFPA 72 subclause setting out design and functionality requirements has been tabulated against the corresponding requirements in EN54. Where there are differences between the two sets of requirements, these are summarised at the end of each of the sections in the report. Using these outcomes, manufacturers can determine what has to be changed to enable their EN54 product to be used in an NFPA 72 installation. Authorities having jurisdiction can also use these outcomes to ensure products comply with the installation requirements that they have set out. It's not the aim within this presentation to detail subclause by subclause the findings which have been arrived at by CS Todd and Associates during the assessment of compatibility. You can study these at your own leisure when you read the report. The main conclusions of the assessment will be presented here and comments offered on the implications of these findings. The first piece of equipment that I would like to present the report's findings for cover EN54 Part 2 compliant control and indicating equipment. The findings of the report show that EN54 Part 2 compliant control and indicating equipment does not meet the requirements of NFPA 72. The details of technical issues that need to be addressed are contained within the tables within the report and these are summarised as a distinction between fire and fault audible warning signals is required at the control and indicating equipment. If a pulsing audible fault indication is used, each on period should be longer than half a second. Silencing of audible fault indication should effectively be only possible at EN54 Part 2 Level 2 or higher. Full equipment function is required at 49 degrees Celsius and 85% relative humidity. A fault on a sounder circuit is required not to affect operation of any other sounder circuit. A 
control and indicating equipment is required to have at least one auxiliary output monitored for faults and no terminal for incoming and outcoming wires is allowed for a single conductor to be looped around it. Now, provided that these potential non-compliances with the requirements of NFPA 72 have addressed, it should be possible to use control and indicating equipment compliant with the requirements of EN 54 Part 2 in an NFPA 72 compliant system. The next equipment category is EN 54 Part 3 sounders. A sounder must be capable of outputting a signal that gives a pulse pattern compliant with the requirements of ISO 8201. Certain marking and data requirements need to be addressed. Otherwise, there appears to be no requirement that precludes the use of sounders compliant with the requirements of EN 54 Part 3 in an NFPA 72 system. I would like to move on now to EN 54 Part 4 power supply equipment. Actual response times for indication of the fault conditions referred to in these clauses of NFPA 72 must be declared by the power supplies manufacturer to be less than 200 seconds. Otherwise, there appears to be no requirement that precludes the use of power supply equipment compliant with requirements of EN 54 Part 4 in an NFPA 72 system. The first of the initiating devices that I would like to talk about are EN 54 Part 5 point heat detectors. The NFPA 72 code requires that heat detectors are marked with a colour code that denotes its classification. Now it may be possible to reason with the authority having jurisdiction that the EN 54 Part 5 temperature classification letter codes are equivalent to the colour coding required by NFPA 72, but this has still to be determined. The exception regarding marking of heat detectors is where the alarm threshold is field adjustable. Here, the detector must be marked with the temperature range. And it should be possible to calculate the response time index if required from the manufacturer's data. And again, otherwise there appears to be no requirement that precludes the use of heat detectors compliant with the requirements of EN 54 Part 5 in an NFPA 72 system. The next initiating device that I'd like to talk about are EN54 Part 7 smoke detectors, which use ionisation or scattered light. Smoke detectors shall be marked with their nominal production sensitivity and tolerance in units of percent per foot obscuration. And smoke detectors that have provision for field adjustment of sensitivity shall have an adjustment range of not less than 0.6 percent per foot obscuration. If the means of adjustment of sensitivity is on the detector, a method shall be provided to restore the detector to its factory calibration. And again, otherwise there appears to be no requirement that precludes the use of smoke detectors compliant with the requirements of EN 54 Part 7 in an NFPA 72 system. I would like to move on now to talk about EN 54 Part 10 flame detectors. The manufacturer will need to provide certain items of technical data. This includes information on the sensitivity variation with angular displacement and also installation and maintenance information. But otherwise, there appears to be no requirement that precludes the use of flame detectors compliant with the requirements of EN 54 Part 10 in an NFPA 72 system. The next item of equipment I would like to talk about is EN54 Part 11 manual call points. The findings of the report are quite simple. The report concluded that there appears to be no requirements that preclude the use of manual call points which are compliant with requirements of EN54 Part 11 in an NFPA 72 system. Next, we'll look at EN54 Part 12 beam detectors. Here, the manufacturer of the beam detector must specify and declare that an abrupt interruption of the beam will cause a fault signal and not a fire signal to be emitted. Otherwise, there appears to be no requirement that precludes the use of beam detectors compliant with the requirements of EN 54 Part 12 in an NFPA 72 system. And now I'd like to talk about EN 54 Part 17 short circuit isolators. The findings in the report also show that there appears to be no requirement that precludes the use of short circuit isolators 
which are compliant with the requirements of EN 54 Part 17 in an NFPA 72 system. And finally, I want to present the report's findings on EN 54 Part 18 input-output devices. Just as with short-circuit isolators and manual call points, the findings of the report have shown that there appears to be no requirement that precludes the use of input-output devices that comply with the requirements of EN 54 Part 18 in an NFPA 72 system. Having talked about the findings within the report, I now want to move on and talk about some of the issues which are related purely to approvals and listings, and also make some other general comments arising. NFPA 72 does not restrict the design to using only products that are tested and listed to US standards. This is confirmed by subclause 1.5.1 in NFPA 72. And here it says that, Nothing in this code shall prevent the use of systems, methods, devices or appliances of equivalent or superior quality, strength, fire resistance, effectiveness, durability and safety over those prescribed by this code. And neither does NFPA 72 specify that fire alarm system components need to be covered by specific standards such as the ANSI UL 268 521 or 864 standard. This is confirmed in F2 of NFPA 72, where it says that the following standards and codes are referenced explicitly or implicitly regarding the design, installation, testing, maintenance and use of these systems and their components. These were used when developing this standard, but not necessarily required practice for manufacturers. The code then lists a number of North American standards. One of the critical points to make is that the code does require that equipment used in the design and installation of a fire detection alarm system is listed by a third party. This is confirmed by subclause 4.3.1 in NFPA 72. And here it says, equipment, materials or services included in a list published by an organization that is acceptable to the authority having jurisdiction and concerned with evaluation of products or services that maintains periodic inspection of production of listed equipment or materials or periodic evaluation of services and whose listing states that either the equipment, material or service meets appropriate designated standards or has been tested and found suitable for a specified purpose. The final comment that I would like to make is that the assessment has primarily focused on protected premises fire alarm systems, which is defined in NFPA 72. In addition, specific requirements for supervising station fire alarm systems, public fire alarm reporting systems, single and multiple station alarms and household fire alarm systems have been observed but generally not considered for detailed compatibility with the requirements of the relevant EN54 series of standards. I would like to bring this presentation to a conclusion by making the following three points. First, there appears to be no major differences which cannot be overcome between the requirements of NFPA 72 and those of the relevant parts of EN54. Second, of the EN54 series standards which have been assessed, in EN54 Part 2 for control and indicating equipment, this is shown to have the highest potential for non-compliance with the requirements of NFPA 72. And finally, for a product to be used in an NFPA 72 installation and claim compliance with the requirements of the code, it must prove that it has necessary approval from a third party certification body. I'd like to express my thanks to you for listening to this presentation and hope that you can find time to read the report.